So far in this study, we've seen how for believers, we are the family of God. And the Lord actually calls us the house of God. And he specifically tells us not to forsake gathering with other believers. The Lord tells us he expects us to meet together, to encourage one another, and also to spur one another on to love and good works. We've also looked at a story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 15, where he talked about the importance of returning home when you find yourself far from the Father. Remember this, your direction determines your destination. And even when we find ourselves far from the Lord, we, like the prodigal son, can come to our senses, we can change our mind, and we can start following a new path that leads us home. We've already seen that the Bible talks a lot about home, but today we're going to shift our focus just a little bit, and we're going to focus on another home that is mentioned in God's word. In Hebrews 13, verse 14, it says, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. You and I may consider ourselves citizens of planet earth, but God says we aren't home quite yet. When I think about heaven and when you think about heaven, it's probably a little bit unclear what heaven is going to be like. We don't know what it's going to be like, what it's going to feel like, what it's going to smell like. A lot of us think about heaven with a huge question mark next to that. In fact, if you're like me, you don't even choose to think about heaven very often. Why is that? Maybe it's because we're too obsessed with things here on planet earth. Maybe it's that we don't have the necessary faith to even believe in something that's greater than what we're currently experiencing today. Or maybe it's possible that the concept of heaven just doesn't sound that exciting to us. I think that last reason is more common among Christians than many of us might think. Many believers that I've spoken with, they view heaven as this never-ending place where people go after they die. And once they're there, they just leisurely recline on fluffy clouds and they're sporting a halo and they're playing a harp and for some reason, they're wearing a diaper. It seems to be a common picture in the minds of a lot of people today. When we think about heaven, we think about St. Peter greeting all the new arrivals by the pearly gates and everybody sitting around a big table having a big feast and eating, I don't know, angel food cake or something, right? I mean, when we think about eternity in heaven, many of us honestly think it sounds boring. However, the Bible portrays heaven as something beyond our wildest dreams or imagination. On the other hand, heaven is inconceivable. You see, even Paul had a hard time explaining what heaven was going to be like. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he goes on to say this, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. That says, even if you use your imagination and you try to conceive how great heaven is going to be, he says, you can't do it. You don't have the capacity or the ability to conceive the goodness and the greatness of this place called heaven. The Bible says heaven is inconceivable. But on the other hand, heaven is still understandable. The reason the Bible talks so much about heaven is because God wants us to know about our future destination. And he tells us heaven is that final destination, the ultimate homeland for those of us who are in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, these all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised. But they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners, check this out, and temporary residents of the earth. Now, those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Certainly, God wants us to know about this place that we're going to spend eternity even if it's hard for us to comprehend. So the question is, what does God's word tell us about this special place called heaven? We don't have time to cover everything about heaven 
in this message today. But I do want to encourage you to take notes as I share with you four things I believe every believer needs to know about heaven, our eternal home. The first thing I want you to jot down is this. Heaven centers around a person rather than a place. When we think about heaven, most of us think about a place. We think about a gathering. We think about a location somewhere beyond this world. But the truth is, heaven is not only a beautiful place where we will gather with other believers for all eternity. Heaven is ultimately about being in the presence of God. If hell is ultimately defined as the absence of God's presence, then heaven should be defined as the reality of God's presence. You see, too much focus is placed on the what's of heaven rather than the who of heaven. Heaven is heaven because God is there. Do you get that? The most beautiful place you can be is in the presence of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it says, In fact, we are confident and we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. Paul says, when we are absent from the body, when a Jesus follower's life on earth is over and they're no longer with us here on the earth, the Bible says that they are home with the Lord. They are in the presence of Almighty God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul was talking about the second coming of Christ. And he began in verse 13 by saying this, we do not want to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. When he talks about those who are asleep, he's talking about people that have physically died here on the earth. And he goes on to say in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. He's saying to believers, y'all better get ready. Because when Jesus says he's coming back for his bride, he's talking about you. Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he's coming back to make all things right. And in doing so, he's coming back for his kids. These verses go on to say in verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Once again, the Bible says that those who are in Christ will meet the Lord in the air. But here's the best part. You ready? This says, and so we will always be with the Lord. Do you get that? We will always be in his presence. We will be in the presence of almighty God forever. Revelation 21 verse 3 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. And he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Mark it down. Heaven centers around a person rather than a place. The second thing I want to point out is that heaven is a mirror that reflects who God is. You know, a person's home typically takes on the personality and the nature of the person that lives there. In a similar way, the Bible describes heaven in the same way it describes God. For instance, the Bible describes God as being beautiful, and it also describes heaven as being beautiful. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 2, it says, From Zion, the perfection of beauty, God appears in radiance. In Isaiah 33, 17, it says, Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. So the Bible describes our king as beautiful. And notice how it describes heaven as well in Revelation chapter 21. It says, He then carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. 
Her radiance was like a precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Beauty is an attribute of heaven. That is a direct reflection of our beautiful God. And the Bible goes on to give us a list of these attributes that describe both God and heaven. For instance, the Bible describes each as glory. It says that glory will be in the presence of heaven. Glory is God. Holiness is another attribute mentioned in Isaiah and Revelation. Immortal, and talking about immortality, is another attribute that describes God and heaven. Light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And in Revelation 21, verse 23, it talks about how the city of heaven is not going to even need a sun or a moon because the glory of God is going to light the whole place up. Perfection is another attribute of God. We see that all throughout scripture. In Psalm 18, it says, God, his way is perfect. And of course, an attribute is love. Love describes God. It also describes heaven. You know, in 1 John 4, 8, it tells us that heaven is going to be a place where we're going to be in the presence of God. Well, that tells me that we're also going to be in the presence of love because Jesus is love. But don't forget, joy is also an attribute that describes both God and heaven. Joy. These qualities of God are also realities of heaven. This is what our eternal home is going to be like. It's going to be a place of glory and holiness, a place of immortality and light. Heaven will be a place with no more fighting behind closed doors, no more depression or diagnosis, no more crying or sickness, no more pain or pollution, no more cancer or coronavirus. But instead, heaven will be a place of perfection completely saturated with the love and the joy that only comes through the perfect person of Jesus Christ. If we truly want to know what heaven is going to be like, all we have to do is look at who God is. Heaven centers around a person rather than a place. And heaven is a mirror that reflects who God is. The third thing I want you to jot down today is this, that heaven will be a new normal. Heaven will be a new normal for all of us. You know, because of COVID-19, the entire world has been forced to embrace a new normal. And like it or not, the new normal is a reality in our world today. Now, I personally believe there will be many things that will continue returning to the way things used to be. But at the same time, I also believe there will be some parts of our life that will never be the same again. I think heaven is going to be sort of like that to some degree. I mean, it's going to contain some of the old but much of the new. However, it's going to be unique because we won't have to adjust to heaven like we're having to adjust to things today. We will automatically embrace heaven as our new normal because it's going to be incredible. The newness that we're going to experience is suggested by many of the things that are no longer going to exist. There will be no more time. There will be no more sin, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. There will be no curse at all. The old heaven and earth have passed away at that point, and Satan, his angels, and all those who chose to follow him will have been cast into the lake of fire, far away from the presence of God. In heaven, there will be a new creation where we will have new bodies, and we will no longer be limited by sin at all. However, not everything will be unfamiliar to us in heaven. We're going to recognize people that we knew on the earth, And we will even do things we used to do on the earth. There will be a lot of activity in eternity. And there will be people that you know there that are waiting for you. In Matthew chapter 17, Peter, James, and John recognize Moses and Elijah. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully as I am fully known. That last phrase, I will know fully as I am fully known, it indicates we shall know others in heaven and be known by others in heaven in the same way that the Lord knows us. I don't know about you, but that's pretty exciting stuff. And it also brings us to the final point of today's message about heaven And that is heaven will be a huge reunion, a huge reunion. People have often wondered things like, 
Will we still be ourselves when we get to heaven? Will we know our loved ones and have ongoing relationships in heaven? Will there be animals in heaven? And the list goes on and on and on. Believe it or not, the Bible answers most of our questions about heaven. For instance, will we be ourselves in heaven? Well, of course you're going to be yourself in heaven. Who else would you be? I mean, after Jesus rose from the grave, he said to his disciples in Luke 24, Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see, I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. I love this picture because it shows us that the resurrected Jesus didn't become somebody else. Pre-resurrection Jesus was the same person as post-resurrection Jesus. And his old body was the same body made new. Our bodies in heaven will be our old bodies made new. And who we are today will be who we are in heaven. And the reason I know that is because the Bible talks about there's going to be a day when we are going to be held accountable for what we do in this life. Well, think about this. If we aren't ourselves in the afterlife, then how in the world are we going to be held accountable for what we do in this life? You are going to be you in heaven. So the other question is, will we know our loved ones and have ongoing relationships when we get to heaven? I believe the answer to that question is absolutely yes, The Bible says that certain things, bad things from our past, will not be remembered any longer. It talks about that in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. But the Bible gives no indication that we are going to experience memory wipe in heaven, causing us to forget our friends or our family members once we get there. In fact, it tells us just the opposite. For instance, Paul, in the book of Thessalonians, he talks about the anticipation in being with the Thessalonians once again in heaven. And he spoke about that in chapters, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And it never occurred to him he wouldn't see them again. He was confident that they would be reunited once again in heaven. I believe with all my heart that relationships among God's people are going to continue in even greater ways than we can even think or imagine. Once the curse of sin is lifted and death is forever reversed, I believe our relationships will be even richer and deeper than they could ever be on planet Earth. For some of you, you're hearing that and you're thinking, man, it's all fine and good and I'm glad I get to see my family once again. But the real question I want an answer to is this. Am I going to see Fluffy again when I get to heaven? And that's a big question and I believe the answer to that is very simple. Are you ready? If Fluffy is a dog, yes. If Fluffy is a cat, no way. It's not going to happen. But seriously, there's no way cats are going to heaven. I'm just kidding. We don't know. The Bible actually talks a lot about animals, but it doesn't give us a specific answer. But it does portray them as Earth's second most important inhabitants, when you think about it. Animals were entrusted to us by God. And in all seriousness, our relationships with animals are a significant part of many of our lives. In Isaiah chapter 65, the Lord says in verse 17, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. He goes on in verse 25 to say, the wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like cattle, but the serpent's food will be dust. He lists four animals in that one picture of heaven. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, he said, Then I saw the heavens open, and there was a white horse. Once again, listen, if there are horses in heaven, who says Fluffy isn't going to heaven? Wouldn't it be just like God to give us the desire of our heart and to take animals that were entrusted to us in the old world and allow us to enjoy them in the new world? Like I said, the Bible doesn't completely answer this question, but I wouldn't be surprised if animals were a part of our great reunion in heaven. Have you ever seen videos of airport reunions or videos of soldiers coming home and surprising their families? For some reason, I always get choked up every time I see a reunion like that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, it talks about another kind of reunion that will take place. It says, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. There is going to be a day when the trumpet blows and Jesus comes back and changes everything. 
in a sense, since we've regathered as the church after months of not meeting together, for many of us, this has been somewhat of a foretaste of heaven. When we gather, we are, in a sense, coming home. However, we've got to be reminded today that we aren't home quite yet. Randy Alcorn did a great job of illustrating this part of his journey in his book entitled Heaven. He said, imagine you live in a homeless shelter in Miami. One day you inherit this beautiful house overlooking Santa Barbara, California, and you're given this wonderful job doing something that you've always wanted to do. Many friends and family live nearby. And as you fly towards Santa Barbara, you stop at the Dallas airport for a layover. Well, other family members that you haven't seen in years meet you there. They're going to board the same plane with you to Santa Barbara. Well, naturally, you look forward to seeing them in Dallas, your first stop. But if someone asked you where you're going, you wouldn't say Dallas, would you? You would say Santa Barbara, because that's your final destination. Dallas is just a temporary stop. At most, you would say, I'm going to Santa Barbara with a brief stop in Dallas. Man, what a great reminder today that our present home on this earth is just a layover, a temporary dwelling place along the way to our final destination. Our eternal home is yet to be experienced. Heaven is our ultimate home, and it's a home that is promised to us by God. And it's a place where we will be reunited with our friends and our loved ones who were saved and chose to make Jesus their Savior and Lord while on the earth. And he tells us that we are to live with the end in mind. He tells us to live today with hope in our hearts and with our eyes looking forward to that day. And he also tells us to make it our mission to bring as many people with us as possible. In his book, Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren says, the way you store up treasure in heaven is by investing and getting people there. May I ask you a question today? Are you storing up treasure in heaven today? I mean, honestly, think about this right now. Can you honestly say that you're 100% sure that if you died right now, that you would go to heaven? I believe some of you would honestly answer that question and say, no. And you know what? If that's you, you can go all in with Jesus right now, and you can change that today. Many of you would answer that question and say, yes, I know that I'm going to heaven. I know that I'm headed to an eternity with God. Then I'd like to ask you one more question. Who are you bringing with you? You know, we love to tell other people about places that we've been, and we love to tell them about the things that we've experienced. Who hasn't looked at a brochure of a distant destination or seen a picture on Instagram and thought, someday I'm going to go there. Someday I'm going to experience that. And yet so many of us hesitate in talking about the one place that God promises is so perfect that the human mind can't even conceive of what it's going to be like. While we haven't been to heaven yet, we have been given by God a brochure, a snapshot of what heaven will be like. And we are now given the opportunity every single day to invite other people alongside of us to go there with us. I want you to understand today, above all else, that heaven is an offer. It's an offer that's extended to everyone. And Christ gives us the details for this offer in Revelation chapter 22. In verse 14, he says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Both the spirit and the bride say, check this out, come, let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. You know, that's talking 
about some of you today. So here's the offer that Jesus is making. Are you ready for this? Jesus himself said, come. If you're thirsty, come to the well. In John chapter four, Jesus puts it this way. He said, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Jesus said, if you come to his well, if you drink his water from his living well, that you will never be thirsty again. I may be talking to a few thirsty people today that need to come to Jesus and finally drink the water that is only available through him. Some of you are thinking about heaven and you know without a shadow of a doubt that if today were the last day on planet earth for you, that there is no way that God would say, well done, my good and faithful servant, welcome home. Heaven is a distant thought, a distant reality. And you know, as of right now, you don't have a relationship with the Lord. There's never been a moment in your life where you have surrendered all to Jesus and allowed him to forgive you of your sin and to put your feet on a completely different path, headed away from the sin that you've once pursued and now pursuing Jesus with all of your heart and all of your might. Today could be that day for you where you go all in with Jesus and he makes you a son or a daughter of the king and he gives you heaven as your eternal destination once and for all. If that's you today, would you simply just talk to him in this moment and say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want to be saved by you. I turn away from my sin and I turn to you. God, I don't want hell to be my eternal destination. I don't want to be away from you. I want to be in your presence for right now and for the rest of eternity. And God, I want to know that and solidify even in this moment. So Jesus, I'm asking you to save me to change me, to make me a new creation. Give me the courage to live for you and to follow you all the days of my life. The simple invitation to come. Did you just pray that prayer asking Jesus Christ into your heart to make him the Lord and savior of your life? If you did, congratulations. That is so incredible. And I would love to help you take these next steps with him. And the way that you can do that is go to extendedfamily.church and push saved. And the second you do that, I'm going to get, actually, you're going to get a form that comes up. And I want you to fill that out as much as you can and then push submit. Then it's going to come to my inbox and I'm going to have the opportunity to connect with you and help you decide and figure out what is next for you. Because there's so many questions that you may have and I want to help you answer those. And so do that. Go to extendedfamily.church and push saved.